you pumped? Are you excited? Oh, I'm I'm pumped. This is this is the epic culmination of everything that I have been working on for 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 decades. <laughs> and it's happening on Zoom. That's right. It's all happening on Zoom. Yeah. Here we are. Here we go, state. <laughs> this is the future. Yep, Zoom is the future. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Thanks everyone, 12 people for showing up. That's wonderful for them. Robbie. And um, so the way this will go is that Robbie will talk for about three minutes. And then the committee consisting of Bob York, Catherine Pruitt, myself, will ask questions and then we'll open it to everyone that's here or on YouTube. So you want to get started? Go for it. <laughs> All right, so this project is, it is a language, but it is also much more than a language considering that this is, this language that I've been making is the language spoken but in the fictional nation of Elfwant Kasanosha, which is part of a world that I have been gradually developing since I was literally seven years old. So I had a lot of content that I was able to compile into this, into the, the full book format, and I'm going to get it printed out into a book format. So, so here we have it. The book, it, it's called The Grammar of the Autogen Language, but it's also history, phonology, orthography, syntax, morphology, and cultural information. And even the history section and the cultural information section is even still in abridged version of everything that I've created throughout my childhood. And that's saying something considering when you look at the contents, the uh, geography and the history section goes basically from page 9 to like page 82. I, I wrote a good 54 pages of this, all just on the history of the Fuano Peninsula, where the nation of Elfwonk exists in this alternative history future Earth, like a, like a million years in the future or so. It is a lot. I made a lot of maps for it, showing the dispersion of different language groups in different countries. I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail on the history section, but ba but basically, these two the two civilizations, the main ones are the Arajansans and the Fuanals, and they kind of conflict with each other a lot over history. The Fuanals, for most of the early history, were way more successful in, in, in most ways, like technology, wealth, etc. But eventually the tides kind of turned and they tried joining into one unified state called Fuanarojun, but that didn't really work out and they get conquered by the by uh, this empire, the Princei. They do have a significant impact on the language. I'm going to get over to the map where the Princei show up. It's a very big map here that shows the Prince Empire here and Pink comes in and they basically do this big maritime takeover. They're, they're a very powerful empire during the late 1200s or so. They come in, they do all kinds of changes. They they introduce a, a vocalic er sound. They bring in a lot of new words that are mostly based on technology. They change the number system, which was originally base 12, but, they, but the Prince I had a base 10 system and they uh, kind of forced that in uh, what is it they talk about cardinal numbers using base 10 but they still use uh, base 12 for a lot of their ordinal numbers and I've got a whole section on numbers for that later but that's just one of the many impacts of the Prince I whenever they invade basically my whole childhood kind of happened from in, in these couple paragraphs right here and everything else is like history that was added on and so I could definitely write multiple books with the content that is included in just those 10 years or so let alone all the thousands of years that happen in between. This whole yard model was so important to me and eventually it, it got destroyed by my parents because they thought it made the yard look ugly after about seven years of its existence, which, you know, it, it kind of did, but of course there was a lot of content and a lot of potential still in there, so I swore to never let it go. Thanks, Mom. Uh, I swear to let it, never let it go, and I, I just went for it. Uh, the phoneme consonant chart. So, uh, the sounds we have pa, ba, 
t b k l a ch j f v z t j h h h l l r y r w m m m m and then m y a Then we have the vowels, the vowels e, a, e, a, u, u, and o. Um, and then it has several diphthongs. We have ye, 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 ya, y, u, yo, a, o, l, i, a, l, u, i, w, e, w, e, w, a, w, a, w, o, i, o, e, o, e, and o. So, in conclusion, this language has been a huge part of the past year, and the entire culture of it has been a part of my entire life so far. So, I'm very glad that you know everything has went well and functioned properly, and I am very excited to get it nice and published into a book and finished. And I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you, Robin. This. <laughs> There I went again. <laughs> great, great job. Normally we clap, but it's hard to do. Yeah, yeah. I did a clap reaction. Um, all right, yeah. So my main question uh, with the phonology, uh, I wonder, are the phonological rules, um, the phonotactics, the syllable structure, the allomorphy, the allophony, is that, um, is that emergent? Like, did you sort of come up with um, a language whose sound you liked and then you sort of interrogated yourself and said, oh, what kinds of allophones am I, have I created? Um, what kinds of syllable structure has emerged from this process? Or was it sort of like, or were there some aspects of it that were sort of prospective? Like, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if the language had a phonological rule like this? And so I will introduce this. At first I was like, is it needs to have an M E A, you know, like an M with a tilde on it. <laughs> that, 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 that was my first thing. Everything else, I was like, okay, I'll do whatever. But then I started looking into, like, you know, Old English and Navajo, and I liked some of the sounds that they had. So I originally came up with some of the ideas for that, uh, the, the phonology itself, based on a lot of the sounds, like the lateral sound that Navajo has, the hua that happens in Old English, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept the M E A because I had to keep the MEA. <laughs> the rules that went with it, those kind of developed as I was trying to say the sounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was listening to myself because I was making all those uh, the scene translations from TV shows and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to all those uh, sounds that were happening and I was saying like, okay, I'm hearing how I'm actually coming out with these sounds that I've written down. So the, these rules are things that exist for me, who is the closest equivalent to an actual native speaker, considering it's fictional. I figured that I would go along with my instinct of a lot of these rules. Dogs survived with human DNA and they eventually, yeah. over the period of a million years, evolved into sort of quasi-humans. Yeah, basically. <laughs> okay, so there is there there's a huge expense expanse of time. Um, if you, if you were able to plug this into a lang existing language tree, what language um, tree would that be? But whenever I was thinking of how the tree would diverge and stuff, I was definitely inspired by like you know how Indo-European developed and split off into its branches. Okay. You talk about pronoun tense? Yeah, basically every, uh, yeah, at the end of every sentence where the subject is held, there's one word that contains the tense and uh, the person who is doing the action. What is it? So we have ya, ka, wa, ye, ke, we, yao, ka, wao, ya, ka, wai, yok, o, wo, also yok, o, wo, ya, ke, we, Yo kyo wio yo kyo wio yu ku wu and yu e ku e we. So if you have pronouns marked for tense, then you don't need to mark the verb in the sentence for tense. Yeah, there's no tense marking in any of the verbs. Okay, so that's yeah. a distinguishing characteristic. 
Yeah, definitely. That. Okay, you have um, conditionality, and later on you have indicativity. So would yeah. you say that both of those are kind of more mood-like? Language to me seems like a key, the mood and the aspect, which you usually think of a language. Is it a tense or a mood or an aspect language? So could you say a little bit more about that, how you've chosen these one, two, three, four, five categories? In, in this example word right here that's on the screen, we have nya koem yehi, where um, we have nya as a separate word, where nya and ru are both, they're definitely both more, uh, what is it, the moods, right? But I, I just called it conditionality because it's something that's uncertain. Like, you don't know, even if you're commanding someone to do something, you don't know whether that thing's going to happen or not. So... But that's what mood does. Mood says, is it real or not? Yeah, exactly. And so I think maybe you could do one is mood and then four could be aspect with the imperfect. But there isn't very much imperfectivity. You've just sort of modeled that a bit on English and possibly on Spanish, I think. Yeah, but that that is definitely inspired on Spanish a little bit. Right, that's just a comment about the typology of your language. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, that's definitely true. I, that that imperfect in quotation marks, that's uh, definitely inspired by how Spanish works with its uh, with like superada or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then the he could also be la or nothing or tai, depending on whether it's certain, uncertain, or something surprising that has actually happened in reality. I think, okay. yeah, I have that. And I have that written as verity. And I like that word verity. I don't know if there's a more. Uh, actually, polarity is probably the better term, but you can use parity here. All right, cool. So dear audience, um, who would like to ask the first question? So I don't know if I just missed this or not, but um, I was wondering how uh, tone factors into the language and maybe how that affects the music system. So just like, for instance, in English, we have tones that don't define words, but they do define like how, like the, I'm not a linguist, but like, uh, you know, like whether it's a question or an answer, things like that. Oh yeah. Well, we have in in Autogen we have question uh, the little question ending that goes on the uh, the tense auxiliary. We have uh, if it's a question, you'll end the sentence with chai, um, and that chai will have the emphasis in that syllable. So they'll s say like, if you wanted to say, what are you talking about? You say hakabanai chai. So that chai will definitely get a lot of the emphasis of way more than the yeah that comes before it. Relating, relating to the music though, I, I made a couple songs in Auto-June, and one of them is on the channel. Uh, and in it, there's a, there's a few times where questions are mentioned, and I make sure that the chai is on one of the more stressed beats in the song. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah? Um, just, uh, I'm an amateur culinary and amateur linguist, but I'm interested in that uh, to create a full grammar for a language, do you start focusing on a specific site, say pronoun or phonology, or do you probably uh, start very broadly to try to account for everything? And then, so would you do top down or bottom up? This um, well, considering this has happened over a long course of time for me, I I kind of started out taking it from a, a few different angles. Originally, at first, I made it so that everything in the sentence that could possibly be specified was like had its own grammatical marker or whatever, and it was really weird looking. So I tried starting it from the bottom up. I would. I would probably recommend starting top down. Like start by saying like okay, it's it's verb object subject and then think of okay, where do the adverbial phrases go? Where do the adjectives go? etc. Does the, is the word order super important or is it synthetic? Like I I I think 
after all the stress that I put myself through, I would recommend going from like a top-down approach. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Emily has a question, I think. Yeah. Hello. Uh, sorry. So once again, I'm not a linguist. I'm a conlanger. Um, but my question is, uh, what kind of um, what's the word? I'm like, uh, what kind of like poetry does the Arjun people like the most? Like, um, I think this is just like a rumor I heard once before, but because um, Japanese people like uh, involuntarily tend to rhyme in their language, uh, rhyming is not that particularly popular in like traditional Japanese poetry. Uh, it's very like so kind of similar thoughts you're given to like Arjun uh, poetry in that kind of way, like what kind of um, linguistical play do they like the most, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've, in, in Arjun it's really easy to rhyme, considering most of the time you're ending the sentence with ya if you're talking about yourself, or ye if you're talking in second person. like. Every phrase or sentence that you say is gonna end with with one of those with one of those tense auxiliaries. It's gonna end with the content of you know what's happening at what time and who's doing it. So if you're speaking, if you're doing like a poem that's in, in first person, like you're talking about your own experiences, then it's basically every sentence will end with ya. Yeah. Or if you're talking about like a natural phenomenon, then you, every sentence will end with yo or ko or wo. So it's really easy to rhyme with that. And then also considering the first words of the sentence, they, they like uh, grammatical rhyming as in they'll like the same types of verbs happening, the just like parallel types of sentences happening in rows. That's how I tried to write it whenever I wrote the Vodara Ya poem, is they like to keep like, sil syllable count moderately important to them, making sure that the sentences kind of grammatically parallel the previous or in certain sets, that's really the most important thing, because like rhyming just kind of happens accidentally for them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Someone else? Huh? I have a little question. Yes? Um, it seems like, you know, you have like a lot of um, pretty unique structures. Like you said, you have verb, object, subject, which is a little strange right there. Um, mm -hmm. And you definitely have like a lot of palatalization just everywhere. Like a lot of feeler fricatives and whatnot. It sounds real funky and stuff. And so I was kind of wondering, like, artistically, like, what were you trying to achieve with this language? Like, obviously, this is the culmination of, like, your life's, like, fantasy world. Like, it's a really, like, big thing, like, personally for you. But, like, artistically with the language, was there any, like, overriding, like, theme or, like, you know, vision you were trying to make with it? So, so I was thinking of it mostly through the lens of the culture of the Fawnal Peninsula. The culture of the 1200s had the technology and the interconnectedness of like the 1950s. That that's kind of like the vibe that it was going for. So I wanted it to. I wanted the language to kind of reflect that in a way that there's some aspects of it that sound really smooth that you can make slang out of really easily so that people can have like quick conversations and make puns and make jokes and stuff really easily like how do i make it so that they can quickly create slang and ha and have a good time with their words and do wordplay and stuff while also like preserving like a certain kind of intensity that they would need to still be like a warfare related people. So I was going to ask, with this process, the whole process of making this language, what was the most disappointing event that happened and how did you go around that? <laughs> um, I, I would say prob <laughs> probably like the most disappointing thing was kind of like right from the start because I'd already created all these names for locations and characters and stuff over the course of my childhood but these names uh, a lot of the names sounded quite Englishy um, 
they, they, they were very English names, and a lot of like their original spellings were spellings that only an English speaker who was seven years old would make. So I knew whenever I was creating it right from the start that I wouldn't be able to call, like, uh, I wouldn't be able to call it just literally just Elfwon Kasenosha. It ended up becoming Eslefon Kasenosia to, to fit in with the actual phonology but some of them it, some of them it was a bit harder of a transition but it definitely all works beautifully with the uh, aesthetics of it now it's still just weird to think about considering I've called a, a lot of the names that I would call them in in English through my childhood had like L's in them and there's no la in auto June it has to be replaced with like a with a wa or a la depending on what what part of the word it's in. Yeah, so that that was definitely the most disappointing part, but I'm pretty much over it now. I like it. Well, we're glad you're over it. <laughs> thank you so much. You did a wonderful job explaining everything in your uh, thank presentation, you. but also in the question. So what we'll do now is excuse you and the audience. So if the audience and you could get off at the moment. And thank you, audience. That was wonderful. So many of you coming to uh, enjoy what Robbie had to say. And um, and now the committee will actually um, deliberate a little bit. And then I'll email you, Robbie, when you should come back in. Does that sound all right. OK? Sounds good. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank and you. thank you all for watching. Good times. <laughs> All right, that went pretty well. <sighs> but we did it. And that's a pretty long recording. But honestly, because this is like the finale, I don't really care how many views it gets. I just, uh, it's gonna be on there. This is uh, Nga signing off. Auto June, pretty much done. I'm still gonna do some things with it, but you know. All right, Mwah. goodbye. Mwah.